sounds, a beautiful sounds from Abunga Central Church Choir. Thank you so much. Indeed, when I get home, all sorrow will be over. Wow, that's so wonderful. We're all looking up to that. Right about now, dear viewer and listener, we come into our yet another segment on the end time prophecy. And this is brought to us by none other than uh, Pastor Roger Skagua. Pastor Roger Skagua comes to us from the Central Uganda Conference and he heads the education and uh, communication department. Right now, he's taking us into the end time prophecy. Enjoy as you watch and listen and learn as well. But don't forget to share with a friend. Invite a friend to watch and listen in because this is really great for everyone. Be blessed. Pastor Roger Skagwa, you're welcome. Greetings, friends. I want to thank the Almighty God who has made it possible for you, wherever you, you may be, at your workplace, at your home, to be 
watching and studying and attending the camp meeting. And by name of Joshua Makula, I come to you from Bunga Central Church, and I'm so grateful that I'm serving our mighty Lord. We are going to read from the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 12. Before I read, let us have a word of prayer. Almighty Father, our God, we ask that you send us your Holy Spirit to teach, to guide, and to convict us of your truth. And may your word stick on our hearts and we follow it in all the days of our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Revelation 12 of 12, the Bible says, Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he has but a short time. May God bless the reading of his word. We are going to have our presentation about understanding end time prophecy by our usual speaker, Pastor Rogers Kagwa. Pastor Rogers Kagwa is heading the Department of Education and Communication from the Central Uganda Conference, Central Uganda Conference of the Seventh day Adventist Church. Pastor, now is your time to serve the Lord. We want to praise the Almighty God for giving us another chance to come to reach you wherever you are. I know thousands and thousands of people who started watching last week logged in and said we are going to watch even the English part and I am thankful that you were there. Last night I had an amazing opportunity to speak to a bishop who sent me a message on my phone and he said that he enjoyed yesterday's sermon. And I hope, Mr. Bishop, you are watching today so that you can also be blessed with these summons. We are going up to Friday with these messages and we are compacting a lot of material into a very short time. So I want to pray that we might be blessed by what we learn today. Let us pray, loving Father in heaven, we need to understand the things that we are studying today. In this camp meeting, which is happening in a scientific way, we want to thank you for the opportunity that thousands and upon thousands of people can learn from only one source in this short time. We ask you to bless all of us as we study your word today. Some of the words might be heavy, but Lord, you know how to do it for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible speaks these powerful words in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. When you begin with verse 7, actually, the Bible talks about war breaking out in heaven. How can war happen in heaven? This is amazing. How can war be in heaven a peaceful place? But we learned that. And the Bible makes those powerful statements and says, War broke out in heaven. Mike and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But... The place was found in heaven no longer for the dragon. And verse 9 says, So the great dragon was thrown out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. Now the Bible goes on to say that he was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Now I want you to understand that the things I'm going to teach today are extremely, extremely political. And I want to go back to the statements I began with. That Bible prophecy is extremely political. And as we started yesterday, we learned many important things. And today, we go to chapter 7 of the book of the prophet Daniel. Now listen, this is interesting. In Daniel chapter 2, which we started yesterday, 
we see God passing through a pagan king, an idol worshiper. And he brought the history of the world 600 years before Jesus is born up to the second coming of Jesus Christ. This time in Daniel chapter 7, as we understand Bible prophecy, something else is going to happen. We are sort of going to repeat chapter 2, but here is the good news. Every chapter you go to, you get more and more information. Now when tomorrow we go to Revelation chapter 13, you will be amazed at the amount of information we are going to show. And all this is because when you study the Bible part by part, a little here, a little there, you are going to really understand God's word. Now, let us go to Daniel chapter 7, and when we go to the first verse, the Bible says, Daniel spoke saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heavens were stirring up the great sea. Now, I told you before that Bible prophecy is full of symbols, symbols, symbols. Now, the Bible goes on to say, and four great beasts came up from the sea. Listen to this one. Each one different from the other. Now, you know, beasts rarely, these hairy beasts, they rarely come out of the sea. Especially when you are dealing with cats, they really hate water. So how come we have beasts that are coming out of the sea? What is the meaning of the beasts? Are we supposed to run out of the room because beasts are coming? Well, we are going to read Daniel chapter 7, verse 17. Now, verse 17 is going to give the explanation of what a beast is. So you don't need to run away or to tremble. No, it is a very straight word. The Bible says, those great beasts which are for are four kings which arise out of the earth. Aha, there it is. Beasts mean kings, but listen to verse 23. The Bible says, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth. Now, how can you understand Bible prophecy? The simple thing is the Bible explains itself. You don't need to run out of the Bible to get an explanation. Daniel chapter 7 verse 2 and 3 are explained by Daniel chapter 7 verse 17 and verse 23. P2 stuff. You know, when I was preaching these things and I, I was traveling with my little girl of P4 and my little boy of P7. By the time I finished this sermon, they knew every single beast and what it meant. And today when you ask them, tell me about the four beasts of, Revela of, of Daniel, they will explain every beast. Now that proves to me that if a P4 kid or a P7 kid can explain beasts, you too can find it easy. Bible prophecy is easy. P2 stuff. Now, we have understood the beasts. So what are we supposed to do? Let us look at these beasts. They are four and they are different from each other. It reminds me of Daniel chapter 2. Now, if you started with me, Daniel chapter 2, yesterday, you realized that we had the head of gold on the statue as Babylon, the chest and arms of silver, Medo Persia, the belly and thighs of brass was Greece, the legs of iron was Rome, you remember that, and then the feet of iron mixed with clay, these were the divided nations of Europe. Now, when you look at what the Bible says, we are dealing with nations, 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 political organizations. Why would God go out of his way to put political organizations into prophecy? I gave you the explanation when I was beginning. It is because when the devil was sent out of heaven, he began with a family, and that was the family of Adam. But what happened is he saw that he was wasting a lot of time with Adam's family. So by the time we reach, we reach um, Genesis chapter 11, he has already gone into politics. And there he has already made Nimrod make the Tower of Babel. 
We begin to see the Egyptian pharaohs. We begin to see the Assyrians, the Moabites. We begin to see the Midianites in uh, the book of Judges. And we see Samson and the Philistines. And as we come to the end of the world, we see Babylon. And all of these things, these are political organizations. Now, Daniel chapter 7, to, to make it very simple for you, the four beasts of Daniel chapter 7, correspond very well with the statue or the metals of the statue in Daniel chapter 2. So this is also P2 stuff. Very, very simple stuff. Let me go to verse 4 and we begin with the first beast. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched until its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Now, you know, <laughs> this is amazing. How can you have a lion with wings? I mean, I mean, this, <laughs> I was working on behalf of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the Bible Society, and we were on a task to translate. And there is nothing that made me laugh as we sat in that boardroom at the Bible Society about um, 23 years ago. No, no, I think it was 29 years ago. I was sitting in the boardroom of the Bible Society and I was representing the Standard Adventist Church to translate the book of Daniel. And there was this wonderful priest. <laughs> My wonderful friend, the priest was there. Uh, he was a translator. And there was uh, this wonderful reverend from the Church of Uganda, another wonderful friend of mine. And as we sat there, the reverend said, yeah, Rogers has come, Rogers has come. Now we can start. We can start Daniel. And I said, why? He said, are you Adventists? We know you with Daniel. You are very serious. And you know, they had put there the people who were translating languages. And they brought this old man to translate Luganda. And so we sat there and we started. Now, when we came to this, that there was a lion with eagle's wings, the old man put up his hand and said, no, that's impossible. We cannot have a lion with wings. Now, the, sec the general secretary at that time looked at him and said, sir, you didn't come here to interpret anything. You came here to translate. And if the Bible says a lion with eagle's wings, you translate a lion with eagle's wings into Luganda. <laughs> so the, the priest looked at me and he smiled, and the reverend looked at me and he smiled. And you know, some of these things look slightly crazy. A lion with wings? Well, because I've got a very short time and I have to go through all these uh, these prophecies, I will just go straight to the point. Yes. This was a lion with eagle's wings. Now, if you know a lion, lions have got manes. Man, that is M-A-N-E, a fully grown lion usually has a golden man. A lot of fur around its neck. Now, that is symbolic and typical of the gold in the head of the statue of Daniel chapter 2. And the golden empire was the Babylonian empire. Now, interestingly, if you go to, when some people, the archaeologists were digging in Iraq, by the way, for your information, Babylon was found in the current Iraq, or you can call it Iraq, whatever you want to call it. And interestingly, I don't know if I told you this, whether I spoke it in Luganda, I forget. The Garden of Eden was also in Iraq. If you want to prove, go and check the rivers in Genesis, the Tigris, the Euphrates, and all those rivers. You are going to find them in Iraq there, or Iraq, whatever you want to call it. Now, the devil said, God, you built a simple little garden. I am going to show you who I am. And he built a tower reaching up to heaven and said, you are just going horizontal. I am going vertical and I'm going to reach you. That's the way the devil operates. He sees godly things and he attacks them immediately. Excuse me for a second. Now, when the archaeologists were digging Iraq near the site of ancient Babylon, they found engravings on the walls. And the surprising thing, the archaeologists found lions 
pictures of lions, but these lions had wings. And they said, the Bible is amazing. I even doubt whether these archaeologists knew anything about God. So, the first beast is the Babylonian empire, led by King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, this empire, I want you to understand very, very clearly about this empire. There is something very important about this empire that you need to understand. The Babylonian empire was led by six kings. 605 years before Jesus was born, it was led by a king called Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar got a son called Evo Merodach. He ruled only two years, and after that, another king called Neriglisa ruled four years, and after that, another king with a very big name, Laboroshakod, ruled only nine months, and 505 555 years before Jesus was born, a man called Nabonidus began to rule, and his son called Belshazzar later became the president. So between chapter, probably chapter 4, and chapter 5 of Daniel, we have six kings. Now, the Bible is very clear that Babylon's wings were plucked off. The wings mean speed. Now, if Babylon had two wings and its wings were plucked off, it means the speed of conquest with which this empire used to defeat God's people were removed and something happened to Babylon. What happened? Daniel chapter 5 says... This king called Belshazzar made a feast. He had a system of drinking and making parties. Now, if you want to stay safe, I told you yesterday, stop drinking. Stop alcohol. That is the quickest solution to many of the people's problems. Listen to this one. When he made a party and he called all the members of parliament and his cabinet and they entered that chamber, Daniel chapter 5, they began to drink from God's holy cup. A people who were fighters now were reduced to drunkards. And as they drank from the cup of the cups of God brought from Israel, the God of heaven said enough is enough. And a hand came and wrote on the wall, and that very night, Belshazzar and his people were killed. This day was 13th October, 539 years before Jesus was born. I want you to understand, people. Everything that Nebuchadnezzar had done, Belshazzar didn't do. Nebuchadnezzar threw God is people into eating bad things, as I told you yesterday in chapter 1. But God saved these young people when they refused to obey the king. And because they refused to eat the wrong things, their brains remained extremely sharp. Today, there are some things that you need to stop eating. And if possible, by the grace of God, if you can stop eating genetically modified organisms, your brains will be safe. That is why we Seventh Adventists believe in the writings of Mrs. White where she says, go to the countryside. Go to the countryside and stop buying stuff from these markets because they are full of things that are going to make your heads sick. Daniel decided he's not going to make himself sick and he became brighter and brighter. Why are millions of people dozing in church every day eating genetically modified organisms? I will say that again and again, much to the discomfort of many people. Well, Belshazzar had a chance because his great-great-grandfather Nebuchadnezzar confessed before God Almighty. When he threw the young men into the fire, the young men never died. The things were written in the history of the Babylonians. Belshazzar never cared to read them. If he read them, he never took them to heart. 
Belshazzar went on doing all these evil things and God never gave him a second chance. When you read in Daniel chapter 1, you read Daniel chapter 2, you read Daniel chapter 3, you read Daniel chapter 4, the final verses in all those chapters. King Nebuchadnezzar, his great grandfather, was always giving glory to God and praising him, turning from his evil ways. Nebuchadnezzar got a second chance. Belshazzar was not given a second chance. Reason, he had all the evidence. Nebuchadnezzar had no evidence. So God forgave him. Belshazzar had all the evidence. He never cared. I want to warn you, young man. You have all the evidence from what your father has been doing or your mama has been doing. God has given them a second chance. Because probably they knew no better. But you know better. And God might not give you a second chance like it happened to Belshazzar because you know what you're supposed to do. And the Bible says in James chapter 4 verse 17, the one who knows the right thing to do and he doesn't do it, to him it is seen. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 26, for there is no longer any sacrifice that will take away sin if we purposely go on sinning after the truth has been made known to us. Verse 27, the only thing that is remaining is to wait in fear for the fierce fire that will destroy those who oppose God. There are some things you are supposed to do and you know it in your heart. But you refuse to do them. Like Belshazzar, that hand is going to write many, many take a rule for sin. You have been weighed in the scales and found wanting. Beast number two. Daniel chapter seven, verse five. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, there is something interesting about this beast. It was raised up on one side and three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said to it, rise and devour much flesh. Let me break that down to the senior one English. There was a bear. Now you need to understand why God is using these beasts. A bear is probably the most angry animal especially if you take its children. You can go to the book of Proverbs and you're going to see what happens there. The Bible says that this bear was raised up on one side. Well, this is the second kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. These Medes and the Persians came on 13th October 539 years before Jesus was born and they had a strategy and an amazing strategy. They diverted the river which was passing through the city and they passed on the dry river bed under the main gate of the city of Babylon. They entered and slaughtered Belshazzar and his army. And that day they began to rule. There was a man called Darius and this is the one we find in Daniel chapter 6. I told you yesterday that these also made problems for God's people. Because whether you are clean, clear, good, serious, that will not keep you safe. Daniel, according to Daniel chapter 6, was a clean political leader. He didn't take bribes. He didn't take anything wrong. But the people he was ruling with plotted to kill him. It was in Daniel chapter 6 that we see what is going to happen to the world very soon. Because here, under the rule of the Medes and the Persians, King Darius was given a very terrible lie by the people he led. And they said, Mr. President, we want people to worship you for the next 30 days. And the king did not see the trick. He just said, yes, yes, I need people to worship me. Never believe in people who call you our man, our man. Those are liars. They are looking for something from you. The king took this for granted and he made a loss. The moment he realized that they were tricking him, it was too late. They were not actually praising the king. All they wanted was to kill Daniel. But Daniel faithfully stood 
And he said, I'm not going to worship a human being, but I worship a God. And he turned and looked to Jerusalem, and he knelt down, and he began to pray. The people saw him, and they took him to the emperor, and they said, sir, kill this man. Why? Because this man is not obeying you. The laws of the Medes and the Persians, according to Daniel chapter 6, verse 14, were unchangeable laws. Let me assure you people, when the laws of the world pass, whether they are going to pass through the United Nations or anywhere, even the president of your country won't be able to save you. King Darius wanted to save his friend, Daniel. But the Medes and the Persians came to him and said, Mr. President, you dare not get Daniel out of the lion's den. Why? Because the laws of the Medes and the Persians cannot be changed. The world is making new laws. Laws that will never be changed. The question is, what are God's people going to do in those final days? When they tell you you are not going to worship the God of heaven the way you have been worshiping him, what are you going to do? The laws are coming. They are going to be very serious. Because when we go tomorrow to Revelation chapter 13, the Bible says that beast will have legs of a bear. And when uh, governments stand on laws, and so the legs on the beast of Revelation 13 are bear's legs, which means the laws of the Mesans and the Persians, which can never be changed. Things are coming. Stop joking around with your Christianity. You people who have been playing around thinking that after COVID, things are going to return to normal. Let me give you the bad news. They won't. Actually, they are just going to accelerate. I want you just to be with me tomorrow and Thursday. And I will give you a few shockers. Things will never be the same. To prove that, you are not going to have Sabbath school anymore. And I think the Sabbath school is the best time of the Seventh Adventist church. Studying God's word in depth. That is no more. Afternoons, no more. Why? Because there is no way you are going to have a church of 300 people and you have to put there 70 people and then you think you are going to hold a morning service and an afternoon service. Afternoons, we have been studying. In fact, as I told you, some churches have decided in, the, in Kenya that, ah, why bother go to church? How can I go to church for two hours, wasting of time? So they said, continue live streaming so that we can get the Sabbath school up to the afternoon. You see, things will never be the same, people. More laws are coming. We have got the COVID laws which are coming and which are going to force people to do things they never dreamt in their lives. Who of us dreamt that airplanes could be, airports could be closed? You see, the president showed us in the talk how planes were all grounded by just a small little virus. And you think things are going to be the same? Start revamping your Christianity. Wake up. Big things are happening here. Laws are being passed. The Medes and the Persian laws and you're going to see them. Let us skip that. Let us go. The Bible says there were three ribs in its mouth. Well, this is Medo Persia. And when Medo Persia came, I wish you could see the slide. It overcame Babylon. Then it attacked Lydia up there. And it attacked Egypt in North Africa. So those are the three ribs. Three nations that were taken out by the Medo Persians. Now, I want you to understand why God is teaching you these things. The people from Babylon who were doing sun worship, the armies which overcame them took sun worship to every nation they were conquering. By the time they reached Egypt, Egypt was also worshiping sun gods. Amen, Ra, and the others. So what is the devil doing actually? With the wars, the devil was extending his territory further and further. Now we already have four nations which are under the control of the devil. But that is not all. We go to the third beast. Daniel chapter 7 verse 6, the Bible says, After this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard. But this one had on its back four wings of a bird. Now that's not all. The Bible says the beast also had four heads and power was given to it. 
If we go back to Daniel chapter 2, we are going to discover that the head of God was the Babylonian Empire. The chest of arms and silver was the Medes and the Persians. But after the Medes and the Persians were destroyed, something interesting happened. Yesterday I told you the story of, Napo uh, of Alexander the Great. This kingdom of the Medes and the Persians, were, uh, it had about more than seven kings. But the last one, the historians say he was the most, the, the most benevolent. But as he was running away from Alexander the Great, his two, his two confederates whom he had decided to kill him and betray him. And when Alexander came to the lifeless body of the king he had come to overthrow, he began to cry because he saw that his own army commanders had betrayed him. So history says Alexander took off his robe and covered the body of his enemy. And he sent for the wives of this king and said, please come and take your husband. Alexander was given credit for that as he began to rule. So Alexander the Great begins to rule 331 years before Jesus was born. And as he begins to rule, this boy has the thirst for fighting. He fought everywhere until he had nowhere to fight. And he did something very interesting. When he saw that he had nowhere to fight, he began to take alcohol. And Alexander drank and drank. He made drunk orgies. He made parties for his soldiers. They drank alcohol like nobody's business until he took a Herculean cup. He had a god called Hercules. And he took a Herculean cup, about four liters. And he drank lit four or six liters. He drank it. After he drank it, they clapped and said, more, more. He took a second one and he fell down in a drunken stupor. He became sick for seven days and he died. Now the Bible says this king, this empire, had four heads. The four wings mean the speed at which Alexander destroyed nations. In fact, I told you last time that when Alexander attacked a nation like Uganda, the Tanzanians or the Kenyans would just say, don't attack us, just bring somebody to rule us. This is a man who had a, a, a saying like, no retreat, no surrender. Alexander cut the bridges wherever he passed so that his soldiers would never run back. Alexander was powerful. Those are the four wings. What about the four heads? Very interesting. In the country where I stay, Uganda, I don't know where you're watching these things from, something interesting happened in 1985. There are four generals who ruled Uganda at that time. In the central, there was General Tito Kerolufua, who was heading the UNLA. Now, somewhere, in some places of Ruwera and some places of Masaka, there was another general. His name was Yoerim Seven. He was of the NRA. And then when you go to Kayunga, those areas, you found another general by the name of Dr. Andrew Takome Kayira. He was leading UFM. And then around uh, Gayaza, then Chiwenda, uh, I don't know this place called Majije, all those areas were ruled by another general. Where well, I'm using the word general for soldiers. And his name was Inkwanga. And he was for the EU, I think he's fed them, something like that. Four generals ruled Uganda. This is the same thing. As soon as Alexander died, four generals rose out of his empire. And one of them was called Lysimachus, another one Cassander, another one Ptolemy, and another one Seleucus. These generals ruled, and after they ruled, they killed two of them, they remained two. And 144 years after Alexander died, their kingdom was taken over by the Romans. Oh, these guys are described as iron. And the Bible says another empire came, Daniel 7.7. 7. Usually when the chapter looks like the verse, something terrible is going to happen. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring and breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. The Bible says it was different from all the other beasts that were before it. Why? It had ten horns. Now I want you to understand if a beast cannot be given a description 
it must be very frightening. The other one was a lion, a leopard, a bear, but this one had no description, no animal type. That is how terrible it was. Now I want you to listen carefully because I'm about to go according to time, but I want you to understand something important. All of these kingdoms were there in Daniel chapter 2. This one, to identify it, it is the legs of iron in Daniel chapter 2, but these are the teeth of iron in Daniel chapter 7. Now, the reason why it could not be explained because it did a lot of bad things to the Christians. It crushed them. The Romans, for them, the World Cup was seeing lions tearing Christians apart. For them, the World Cup was seeing Christians burnt on the stake. For them, the World Cup, they would gather in arenas to watch the World Cup, but their World Cup was seeing a Christian pulled by horses across the stadia, and his skin, or their skins, get off. They were terrible. The Romans were dreadful. They were horrible. The Bible says, with their huge iron teeth, they devoured. Not only that, if anything was left, they stamped it and crushed it, trying to crush the word of God. Now the Bible says, I want to be quick, that this beast had ten horns. Now you remember, yesterday we said in Daniel chapter 2, that the toes were ten. Interestingly, the horns are ten. Now, uh, we might not have enough time to go through all this, but we discussed yesterday that the Roman Empire collapsed, and when it collapsed, out of it came ten nations. And we discussed those nations of Europe, where we had the Burgundians, the Suevi, the Ostrogoths, the Vandals, and the Heruli, and all these uh, nations, which ended up becoming Great Britain, German, France, Portugal, Sweden, Switzerland, and all of those nations. Daniel chapter 7 adds something that Daniel chapter 2 doesn't have. What does it add? Verse 8. I was considering the horns, says Daniel, the ten horns, and there was another horn. A little one coming up from the ten horns. And before this horn, three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. Uh-oh. Daniel is watching. Bible says, and there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man. And a mouth that was speaking blasphemous words. Uh-oh. Now this is a difficult fellow. What is a horn? Uh, have you been following? I wanted you to read the horn. Okay, let me skip that. A horn is a king. The nations of Europe basically were kingdoms. I think you can easily see that we have all these kings, the queens and the kings there in Europe. Yesterday we studied something important. That the kings of other areas got married to princesses. The princess of one area, one nation, married princesses of another nation in Europe so that they would intermarry to unite Europe. We gave the example of um, Napoleon marrying a Louise. But that failed. Then the war dictators began to come. When the devil saw that, he could not win this war by intermarriage to unite Europe. He thought of war. And we saw all the war dictators which came, like Benito Mussolini, Adolf Hitler. We saw Louis XIV. We saw Charles V. We saw uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. And all of those came to unite Europe, but they failed. Now, the Bible is very clear. When the politicians fail, then the devil comes back to the region. Now the devil does a trick and he brings another king and this king is both political and religious. Listen to this. The Bible says 
that there were eyes in this horn, or this king, and the eyes were like the eyes of a man, and a mouth that was speaking things against God, pompous, big, blasphemous things. Let us explain the little horn, then we will pack our bags and leave. Number one, how can we identify this little horn? Number one, it rose among the ten horns. And we said the ten horns are Western Europe. That means the enemy of God is not going to come from America, although America has its problems. He's not going to come from Africa, although Africa has got its problems. But the man who is going to hurt God's people is going to come from Europe. Because he's coming from the ten horns. There it is. Friend of mine, let us go ahead. Do you remember that the ten horns came out of the beast? And the beast is Rome? That means the little horn is supposed to come from Rome. That is not all. I want you to go to the legs of iron. When you go to the legs of iron, you are going to see in Daniel chapter 2 that the iron even goes to the feet of iron mixed with clay. That means Rome and its powers will remain a dominant factor in the European Union. I will come to those things. Number two, there is something interesting. This little horn or this king will rise after the ten horns. And that is very true. The it will rise after Babylon, after Medo Persia, after Greece, and after Rome, and after all these nations rise up, which we have as the current European Europe. Number three, it will have eyes like the eyes of a man. Now, what do this mean? Eyes represent intelligence. Unfortunately, because the eyes are the eyes of a man, the intelligence will be human human thinking, human ideas. This king will be using his own human things, not godly things. So it is going to be a human religious system based on money's teaching. Now let us follow this very carefully. There is something which is said in Daniel chapter 7 verse 24. It says, this king shall be different from the first ones. How is he going to be different. Let us look at it. Verse 24 says the same thing. It shall be both religious and political. Why? Because it is going to do something that you are going to see. Verse 25. What is this power going to do? Verse 25. He shall speak great words against the most holy God. Uh -huh. And number two, he shall wear out the sense of the most high God. Number three, he shall think to change times that he can make decisions for God. Now the background is and these emperors were worshipping the sun and actually those emperors believed that when they die they go and become gods. This very teaching came even into the Christian church. There was a man by the name, uh, th this emperor, Constantine, who ruled around the 300s. One day rose up and he said, in order to unite my empire, I'm going to make everyone worship on the venerable day of my God, the Son God. So Emperor Constantine, 321 years before Jesus was born, I mean after Jesus had gone, around 300 years after Jesus had gone, or some 200 years and 90, 290 years after Jesus had gone, this man comes and changes God's holy day. From that day, the fight will now begin on God is day against man is day. The Bible says he will change times and laws of God. And we have seen it happening since the year 321 up to today. The final battle is going to revolve 
around this issue of the Sabbath. And this is where we get the idea. The little horn coming up, changing God's holy day. And it has done that. And the Bible will tell you in future that he changed God's law and he prospered today. Millions of people across the world worship on the day that was set up by this king. That day is called Sunday, the sun day. Because a pagan king <coughs> changed this day from Sabbath, Saturday, to Sunday, the first day of the week. And millions, actually billions of people all across the world are following something that was started by a pagan emperor who was worshipping the sun this evening the challenge comes to you straight why don't you go to your bible and check out the truth about the day of worship this king did not stop there he actually removed the second commandment which deals with idols from god is Ten Commandments. And so he changed the second commandment and removed it totally. And he changed a 24-hour period from the seventh day to the first day of the week. And he fulfilled Daniel chapter 7 verse 25 that he will think to change times and laws. As I conclude this phase today, I challenge my viewer to think twice. Go back to your Bible and carefully, ever so carefully, check what day God told us to worship. But I'm going to read you two verses that might help you as I close. Number one, please come and read for us a verse in the book of the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 20. In the book of the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 20, you are going to find something very interesting there. In Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 12, the Bible makes this powerful statement. It says, verse 12, Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctifies them. When God gave us the Sabbath, that Sabbath was specially designed to be a sign that shows you that he is the one that, that sanctifies you. Not a human being. Verse 20. Ezekiel 20, 20. Bible says, And allow my Sabbath, and there shall be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord, your God. The Sabbath, the true Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath, Saturday, is the sign that marks God's people. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 1, at least, can you see that one? Or oh, should I read it again? The Bible says, And after this I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor the sea, nor any tree. And I saw another angel coming from the east, having the seal or the mark of the living God. And he cried out in a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, do not hurt the earth or the sea or the trees until we put a mark or we seal the servants of our God in their foreheads. God does not put his mark on hands. No. The devil is the one who puts the mark on the hand. God puts his mark only on the forehead. Why? Because he wants you to make an informed decision this evening. As the angel is putting a mark, the seal on God's people who accept his holy Sabbath, I want to invite you to accept the Lord. Check your own Bible. Check for the truth as it is written here. And get the mark of God, not the mark of the beast. Because the mark of the beast is a Sabbath that was put up by a human being, and the mark of God is the Sabbath that was put up by God himself. 
God bless you, friends. I'll be excited to be with you tomorrow. Just keep on sharing this video. Let thousands upon thousands understand this truth because the final battle is going to rage between the true Sabbath and the wrong Sabbath. Stay here and you learn the truth. God bless you and let us pray. Dear loving Father in heaven, I want to thank you for this message which you spoke today. Millions of people across the world have been wondering what they are following. But today, you have revealed the source of what they are following. I pray that you speak to that, that man, that woman, so that they might make a decision to follow the Bible truth before it's too late. Thank you for blessing us in Jesus' name. We'll meet tomorrow by the grace of God. Don't miss.